Yeah, welcome everybody. I think uh, this is, uh, again, like I said, I, I, I feel humbled that all of you have stayed along this far. So I suspect that uh, most of what, we, what I have talked seem to have some uh, value and you think that that should be useful to you. And uh, uh, like I said, given the, uh, the time and given the um, short uh, structure that we had decided for it, if there is something, and this should be a good beginning but this is not complete. None of these things that I've touched upon are easy to be completed in a short uh, 50 minute uh, deliberation. So what I've tried to do is to give you some framework that you should be able to do things without being intimidated if you are not a regular user. If you have used it in the past, this should tickle your memories and you should be able to do something with it. Um, this is a collaborative effort. So I suggest and I hope that all of you should uh, stick to it together and uh, I do not uh, claim to know a lot of it. Um, most of these things are either uh, self-learned or learned on the job or uh, on the side. So uh, if there is a need, uh, feel free to reach to me and between me and you and uh, some degree of poking around, uh, probably we should be able to go beyond what I've tried to cover here. There was this question that came um, last week and remember that I was trying to, uh, I, I was passing these arrays with a star and I think uh, someone brought it up. Why am I doing it with that star? So I would give first, I will touch a little base on there because I think that's what the problem is that when you try to tell something from an end product perspective, some of these little nuances get lost. So here is an example. Uh, the first thing we're gonna again, go back to our uh, NumPy. And so I import the NumPy as as usual, as an NP, uh, NP, as an alias, and then I generate a simple array. And so in this case, the array is gonna have the elements, the members, one, two, three, and four, and you can print it. And as you see here, it gives you a one, two, three, four. Remember I told you that if you multiply this or do any operation, the operation by default will then get broadcasted to each member. So if I multiply this by four, as you would expect that one would become a four, two would become eight and so on and so forth. So this is how it happens and this looks good. You can extract a single element from there. Um, you just extract by, remember Python is a zero index structure. So if you take the zero, that will be the very first element and then gets extracted. Now, if you were to pass such a array to a function, um, let's see what happens. So we have a first function here. So it's a very simple function. I define the func my func, takes an argument. In this case, you can name it whatever, uh, an array. And all it does takes is that takes the argument and it multiplies it by two, very simple, and then returns it back. And if we use that, and if we print it, so remember I said you that I have an array of four. So first example, I just pass it a single element. And if you do it, it returns two because the first member was one, got multiplied by two as the function is doing and returns it and we get it printed back. Similarly, if we were to do this thing as if, if we get this function an entire array, this would work too. So remember we have this array of one, two, three, four. If we do this, it returns. We get the basic array, which was one, two, three, four, get returned by multiplying by four. But what if we don't know how many elements we are passing? In the situation like that, let's say we have a different function. And now this time we have a function called my func A, B, C, D. And we expect four arguments to be passed to it. Those arguments to be added together and then multiplied by two. So now what we need to return is we need to return the sum of A, B, C, D multiplied by two. So I have an NP dot sum A, B, C, D, and then I multiplied by two. This time, if I pass it an array, remember my basic default expectation is to pass four things. Now this wouldn't work. So if I have this function, if I return it, as I expected, it wouldn't work. Because by default, my function required four things, but I passed it only one array. Now, surprisingly, you remember that array has four elements, but those elements are not being passed together. So how do I deal around this problem? The way to deal around this problem is you don't pass your function pre-default arguments. So now if I replace this A, B, C, D with say my func star dot arg, which is, or you can call it whatever, arg is not important. It's traditionally we call it arg because that's an argument. So if I pass it as an star 
arg, what this would do is that now it will open that array, however many elements there are, will sum it together, and we are not telling how many members there are, so it will sum together and then multiply it by two. So now, if I repeat this, as you see here, it's summed together four, three, seven, two, nine, and one, 10, and then it returns 10 times two. And so th this is what is called the unpacking, and it is very useful when we don't know beforehand how many inputs we are passing. So we can create, and this is, this is again just to illustrate that point, we now create two different lists. We create a list which is ranging from zero to five, and then we create another list which is zero to 10, and we print it here. So as you see here, now I have a zero, one, two, three, and four, and then I have zero to nine. If both of these have to be passed to the same function without knowing what the function is gonna take, we would not have been able to take it without that star arg argument. So now in this case, if we do it, both of those functions are returned as expected. So that was the logic of having that star dot arg, and it is very useful whenever you want to rip open the array, not knowing how many members in that array would be. And that's a useful way. So oftentimes, whenever you're creating a function, think further ahead what might be the need of that. And if you think that you are gonna pass at some stage multiple members, pass it on as a star. As a star. Is uh, it clear? Could I, uh, could I just ask a question? Yes. Just to be clear, when you use a star, you're taking a complex, a single complex object and like unpacking what's inside it as opposed mm -hmm. to having any number of arguments, right? Yes. You're, you're basically saying I have one argument, but unpack everything that's inside that yes. complex um, item. Yeah. And is, is that a, something that um, is generic to all of Python or only like- No, this works, yeah. Arrays? This, um, this like would if you did work. a list, would that work? Uh, yeah, this would this would work for most uh, most situations. I mean, the star operator is a core uh, Python operator, so it would work across. Uh, we're using NumPy only to generate the uh, generate the, the 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 vector array, and that you have to use because there's no other. Python didn't start as a numeric language, so the only way to utilize the numeric structures they have to come from uh, they have to come from uh, Python because Python's default structure is only a list structure. So if you have to have a multi-dimensional array, you have to utilize a NumPy, but that's not needed. Okay, so let's start on um, the actual uh, purpose of today's class. And like I said, uh, this is gonna be a very, very, if I say the tip of the iceberg, the tip is only the tip of the needle. I mean, images are a giant structure and uh, as the field has moved, so have the requirement and expectations. My goal in this, uh, in this is to utilize, and again, because we don't have the benefit of you all to install uh, the fancier, more modern libraries, like OpenCV would have been a better one to do it. Uh, Mahotas is a new one, uh, and it's a reasonably good one. Unfortunately, all of that demand that I would have been helping you to install something like that, and you could then uh, use them to say, recognize cats from dogs or uh, make the computer to identify which is cat and which is dog, and then count them and stuff like that. But, but, but that shouldn't be disheartening from doing the conversation around using Python uh, for even the simpler image processing task. I mean, given that some of us are biologists, even those tasks can become really tedious when you have to do them more regularly. So I will, I will touch on that. Um, and then um, a, an image processing using Python could require several semester worth of course. So I don't, we don't have the luxury for that. What we're gonna use is then, yes, like I said, we are gonna use the standard NumPy libraries. We will use the PyPlot. Um, I am also using, in a, along with that, a different plotting routine, which is very good, but then again, it requires several classes worth of doing just that. So bear with me. Uh, I'm introducing CBARN. I, we don't have the luxury to talk about it, but what it does, it gives you way much control on what you can uh, plot on uh, the on top of the pi plot structure. So uh, we have these, uh, so what I do is that I import the C barn with its standard alias SNS. 
IP define the colors and these are just the HTML color code. So there's nothing fancy. I could have called them red, blue, green. Uh, I just have to remember what they are. Uh, you can look at them on the web and you know what they are. And then there is a style has been set where the background is white. Uh, palettes would be taken from these colors and then rest of the thing. So don't, don't fuss over it. It's not that important. Um, you can use them as it is and they will still work just fine. And then I'm going to, because we're going to embed these plots within the notebook. So I have to call this uh, percentage matplotlib inline. So you do that. And then I'm going to use a bunch of these uh, scikit libraries. Scikit is a very powerful, one of the first, actually the first, I suppose, um, library that was built around images and, and image routines. So we're going to use these uh, uh, actually, sorry, not the scikit, but the, um, yeah, the, the, we will use the SKI image libraries. A lot of these libraries I would not necessarily be using today. Um, as a habit, most of the time what I do and what I suggest is that as you begin to compile up your libraries, uh, just call them upfront anyway. It doesn't hurt you. Uh, it's not going to overload your system and you save yourself the hassle of trying to run something and not remembering, well, which library did I not run here? Although some people prefer to call the libraries as they need. Um, I have the other habit of giving the, uh, the, the sync full of libraries up in the beginning if I know that that's what I'm going to do and I just go along that. So uh, just call all these libraries and um, SKI image or the scikit image is a giant structure. Uh, please look it into it. There is a lot more. Uh, and as you poke around, you will learn way many more things. And a lot of these things have a very good tutorial on the web itself. So nothing that I'm doing here is that innovative. If you, uh, uh, if this somehow excites you, go look at them on the web, read them. They all have their vignettes and uh, small uh, tutorials and follow them. Um, one more simple thing. So because I'm going to do certain things which are very simplistic, it requires me to also go back and talk about some basics of how these things might work. So going back, let's generate an array. And I have a an array here from 1 to 10. Um, by slicing, if you have to use every second element, what you're going to do, you're going to use this kind of a notation. So it is everything to everything, skipping by two. That's what it is. And so if you do that, you get 1, 3, 5, and 7, which is what you will expect. You hopped over every one of them. If you had every second element, so in this case, we started from the beginning. Zero is implicit. If you don't write it, it is given. If you wanted it from the first to the last by skipping every second one of them, you will use define it. Or if you had to go three to something, you will define it. So here now we're going to take every second element starting from first, you get two, four, six, eight. If you have a multi array, so you have now this one index array one to nine and then you have 11 to 99 and I've chosen these numbers so you can identify what's going on. If you generate this kind of an array and you want the first element from there, you will be defining it as this. So what we have here is this now zero here tells the first of this and one tells that of that zero, we take the first a second element, which is the two and that's why you're returning it. Let's say if we were to give it one to one, it will be this first array. So this is the z this is the first array, which is the zero index. And the next one here is the second array, which is the one. And from there, the second one, which is this 22. So if we do this, you will see as expected, you get the 22. So now we can mix those other things that we have learned so far. So we can to go from one to everything take the second element and then we go all of that and we take only the second. So if this would be now for the first operation and the second operation, and as this you would expect, this will return you in the first array, everything skipped over one. So we get the 11, 33 and so on and so forth. Similarly, you can do this where you have every one of them and you get every one of them because we predefined what that number is. Why am I telling you this? Because before we go to a fancy image, we need to understand what is going on behind the hood in terms of an image, what we call. Now, for Python, everything is numeric array. Uh, numerics can be, well, not true, and there are strings, but for, for, the, for these purposes, an image is nothing but 
an array of numeric and float values. They can be integers or they can be float. Uh, actually, we prefer here an integer value. So let's create an image. And I will create a very simple image that you all would recognize uh, a chessboard. And remember, chessboard is nine times nine. So there are, we will create a NumPy array of all zeros, which are nine by nine. And you can see what that looks like. So just for a refresher, this will give you an array. As you can see here, it's nine by nine array of all zeros. Now, what we're going to do is that we're going to change these to a zero one arrays. So we will take every element of the first row, convert it to one, and we get this. So now we have taken the first line and we converted them to zero, one, zero, one. That's still not quite the chessboard. For chessboard, we also have to do this for the second. So we go to do the same thing. And now we have the zeros and ones and zeros and ones. And now this begins to look like the numeric representation of what you would expect a chessboard to be. Remember, uh, we can have zero as a white and we're gonna have one as a black, full saturation for grayscale and no saturation for uh, the white scale. And now if we do this, we're gonna, so remember in matplotlib, we had the plt.plot. Here we're gonna use the matplotlib's m show as to show the image. Uh, the dot plt dot plot that we have used pretty frequently that is good for the linear plot. Uh, you can use the scatter plot. Here we're going to use the m show to show that. If we do this, as you notice, you get your familiar chessboard. Now, if you were to be doing this, say on your own screen, and if you pay attention, this is not quite white, and the reason is because by default, the uh, matplotlib uses a thing, a color map, which is called viridis. We can bypass that by giving it cmap gray. And in that case, we are choosing true black and true white. And if you do that now, you will see this looks more familiar, black and white chessboard. So that's basically what the what we are trying to do here at the simplest level, how we're going to manipulate and show the images, how we display them, and understand what's behind the image. Image is nothing but a numeric array underneath the hood. If you notice, there's another odd thing, and that's quite kind of unusual for uh, image displays where your top index starts from zero. So unlike the normal plot where your index starts from zero, zero Cartesian plane, this starts as zero at the top, going downward, and then going from left to right. You wonder why is that? Well, as it turns out that if you remember before our modern displays came along, in fact, the monitors were unheard of, everything had to be plotted literally on a paper trail. And there you had to plot the beginning first. It's the image dump. What you're doing is the data dump. So, but you can change that if, if you don't like this, although for most practical purposes, it doesn't matter, but in some cases it might matter. If you want to reverse it, you can do this, the reverse, which is the origin you can set and you can set the origin to left, right, whichever way you want it. Um, I don't know why, sometime you might have to, if you have an image which needs to be spun around, you can do that. So you can, um, you can always use that. Now, just to re-emphasize the fact that this image chessboard is nothing but a numeric array, you can always check its type. And remember, this is a black and white image. Um, we have no color in information here. So when you look at the type chessboard, what you get is numpy.nd array, which is a numeric array. Um, this is not the kind of image you generally are gonna be handling on day-to-day -day life. So let's start with a built-in real image. And what we're gonna do, because we are using the scikit library, and in the beginning we had imported the scikit's data structure, data package, which comes with a lot of pre-built images if you want to learn it, if you want to do it. And it's always good to use those images because they've already been uh, tested. And so most of the routine that you will be trying, if they fail, they wouldn't fail because you were using an image, which is not quite the kind of uh, image that you should be using for those kind of purposes. So we will import an image, which is built in into that called camera out. It's data.camera and we give it the name camera. You can give it photo if you want to, but we're going to give it a name camera. And now we will plot it and remember, don't use the default scale because this is a grayscale image. And if you called it uh, as a default, it would not look quite black and white. So here is the image. 
this is the image of this guy, gentleman, who has now been uh, immortalized in the Python scikit data structure, taking a photo on a pretty ancient looking camera. Remember this image again, it's an NDRA and we can confirm that. Um, what's important is that to look at into this, that the this array, and that is true for a lot of images, they are made out of these unsigned integers. So that's the data type inside it. It's those one, two, three full integers that we are talking about. And the data shape here is 512 by 512. Um, and because this is a grayscale image, the only information just like our chessboard image has is the zeros and one. Those are the two endpoint. So the 512 here is the size. So it's the number of columns and number of rows. That's what the 512, 512 is. Um, you can also call if you were to use it, and this is not the only image that you can work with it, and we will be importing our own images. But before we go to importing image, you can also get these images from say websites. So you would do in this case, what you would do is that you would be calling a routine that I had called before without emphasizing, uh, call IO. So it's somewhere down here. I have from the scikit, I have called this input output routine. And once we have the input output routine, we can call the input output routine to now im read or the image read it straight from the website. And that website image then can be rendered by the in show. And as you will see it, it generates that. If you were to drop the colors, you can put it into grayscale and then the grayscale will take the colors out. Now, just because we have this camera image, which is a black and white image, now we can compare the fundamental difference between a grayscale image and a color scale. So look at here, the data shape here is two uh, vector. So it's like a two dimensional array. Whereas in this case, this has the third dimension, which is the three. It's the last in array, it's the last dimension where the value for the colors are stored. So the way the RGB images are, and that's why they are called RGB uh, images. Uh, and the reason why we are using RGB is because they are the one you use to render those images on the screen. There are three pixels. You have the red pixel, you have the green pixel and the blue pixel. And it's their combination that makes the colors. So each pixel will hold the intensity value for red, green, and blue. Going back to our chessboard model, you have the zero and one, those are the maximum values. Now there's a lot more nuances that go into how the RGB images come along. There's a color map where because how our eyes see the color, we don't see equal amount for all the colors. So if we were given an identical lumens of red color and identical lumens of the blue and the green, our eyes would not photochemically see them at the equal intensity. So there's a lot more mathematical uh, processing that goes under the hood to make sure that because of our difference of the sensitivity to the photochromes in our eyes, we still can see those colors at the equal. So there is more to do it in what is called the color map. Uh, we would not go into it, but the point is that to create the RGB image, each color is assigned to an eight bit unsigned integer. So that means that what we have is the, all the colors that we have, they are two to the power zero because it's a bit image, right? So it's one and zero, so two to the zero, minus it's eight bit coming from the old world when the memories were limited, so two to the power eight. And because Python is a zero index value, so the first is already taken, so we have two to the power eight minus one, and that whole, you have two to the power zero to two to the power eight minus one, where zero is the black and 255 is white. So instead of that, uh, that, that the, pi, the chessboard that we made with the zero and one, would we do the other way around in the RGB system that zero is black and now 255 is white. And so that's basically how the RGB images. And so that's what the last uh, vector here is. So use that just like what we created for the chessboard. Let's create an image here, uh, which is now an RGB. So in this case now, I'm gonna create a vector of zeros. And like I said, five pixel uh, high, two pixel wide. And in this case, now we're gonna have to add the value for RGB, which is always three because R, G and B, there are three indices. So we create this. And once, and you can just see that how it would look like. Um, just to give you a little um, primer on how that will look like. So if you do this, 
here is your that image. So like I said, it's a it's a stack representation. So you have um, height of five, a width of two. So you can see that there's one, two, three, four, five. The width of two, which is not that easy to see here, but basically these each row is the width. And then because we have an RGB image, we have allocated the values for each color in that system. So let's hide that up and we go back to creating a color. So if we were to fill it with say, uh, 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 a simple RGB. Uh, remember, I told you that the R, G, and B, each of them holds the value from 0 to 255. So if we set the red value, all the red values on the first channel to say 0, the next one all to 255, which is the max, and the third channel, which is the blue channel, to all to 0, what we're going to get is an image, which is the max on the green channel. So we should call an all. And as you expect, when we render this, this would be a green image. If we were to do this, say the other way around, let's say that we had a hundred of this and a hundred of this, you will see a different color, which would be down here. And so basically that's what uh, is going under the hood. And what we are doing is that we are manipulating those RGBs uh, and you can change the shape. And this is a very simple image, but I think it does translate uh, what goes on under the hood for uh, for creating these RGB images. So I'll stop, pause here for a second and see if there are any confusions or questions. Does anybody has a question? Okay, so look like we are good. Now, the reverse is slightly more complicated. So here we had an image we generated, but what if we had uh, images in um, say each channel and we want to merge them back and that's a little more involved process but I'll go with a simple example. Um, let's create an array A which is again like I said this array of one two three and we create an array B and we do it two three four so they're very easy you can see them and then what I will do is that I will use this called D stack where I'll take those arrays A and B and put them on top of each other. So here is that we get the one, two, three, and we get two, three, four, and now we have stacked them as one, two, two, three, and three, four. Now you have to make sure that you are matching them right dimensions, and that's why I said this is slightly more involved, and sometimes you can get into trouble. But I'll give an example. So I'll give an example of, say, using this. And let me do this. Uh, we do first here, vlt.mshow and we generate R. So if we plot this, what we are doing here is that we are generating random numbers of 10 on the each channel. We have R channel, G channel, and B channel, and we just giving it 10 random values. So, okay, that didn't go right. Actually, what I had to do was just to print the R because we don't have an image yet. So here, as you see that we generated uh, an array of 10 values and it's the same for each one of them. Now, um, what we're going to do is that we're going to create a stack of them. So what we do is that we take this D stack and we zip them, which means we put them into one, uh, one common thing. So we can similarly do the zip here and, and you see that they have now been all zipped together. So we hide it and now we display it. And as you see here, here is our, the color has been rendered on these RGB scale. And because we had these uh, random values, so they are just a random rainbow of colors and they would be different uh, if you run them multiple times because we didn't have a standard seed. So, Basically, that's what, and you can see that in this case now, the, the, because it's an RGB, because we created an RGB, we have a one, uh, one pixel uh, uh, width, 10 pixel wide, and three colors on the index. So that's basically what the RGB is. So much for all the, the theoretical things. So you were wondering, well, where is something that we can take home and actually work with it? So um, I had to 
try to find something that could actually give a demonstration of why we do all of this. And some of the biologists might be familiar and I wish that I would have uh, called for an image, but a lot of the people who work with the fluorescence microscopy, and I think Steve would remember uh, his uh, fluorescent microscopy images probably. Um, what we do is that we take the cell and if you want to see the different component of it, we uh, take antibodies and we stain them with different antibodies. So like uh, this endothelial cell is an example. And basically this image comes from here, courtesy, um, actually not this one, the one I'm using is the other one. It's an image of these cells that were sent to the, spa uh, to the space station to see whether uh, the gravity has any effect on the endothelial cells and the blood in general. So I'm basically uh, just using that image uh, and the source is given here. When you run it, you will see that the file is down here. This is the one we are using in the data too. And what this has been, what has been done into this is that the actin has been uh, attached to the, uh, has been probed with a GFP based antibody. So the actin would look green. And the DAPI, which is a standard stain for nuclei, will stain them blue. And that's what basically you are seeing here. The blue here is the DAPI stain and the green is the actin. And of course, on the gray scale is the, the bright field. So we're gonna do that. Like I said, you can download the image from there or if you go to my data, uh, go to the data file, you will see this file called endothelial underscore cells.jpg. So we will use the IO routine, imread it. Uh, we set the figure size 10 to 10. You don't have to fit it as figure, but uh, if you want to, you can remove this. And now we do the im short of the endo cells. I don't like those axes and you will see why, what I mean by this. If you have this, you see these annoying axes which serve no purpose. So we turn them off and if you do this, now we have this beautiful image rendered as it looks there. Like I said, the blue was the cell nuclei that contained DNA and the green was the actin protein that is the motility cell. So we can now do these uh, NumPy manipulation that I just showed you to then extract these channels. So the simple thing, the very simple thing, what we're gonna do is that I'm gonna create three copies of that image. We use this dot copy. So we do this endo cells that I just gave it. I create the dot copy and I give it an actin copy, a DAPI copy, and a red copy. Red has really bright field information. So I could have called it bright field, but let's call it red. And then what we're gonna do is that because we know the actin is the green channel, we will set the red and the blue channels to zero. And how do we do that? Remember it's RGB, R is the zero, G is the one, and the blue is the two. So we take those values, we leave all the colons, all the, all the everything that is out there except the last uh, dimension, and we set for R channel to be zero. So we get this actin and we did this zero, and then similarly we set the blue channel to zero, and we created now an image for actin, which is uh, gonna be only green image. Similarly for DAPI, we did the same thing. And in this case, we set up the, uh, the what we have done is that we have done the uh, red to be channel to be zero and we have set the green channel to be zero in this case, uh, which is the axis one and leave the blue alone. And once we've done that, similarly we, for the red also, but in this case, because there is no real information, what I've done is that I have not set anything to zero. I've just set, taken the last of that, the first axis and keep it as a red. And now we are gonna use this, and this is slightly different from the other matplot routines that I've used. So I'm gonna use this called subplot routine. And unfortunately time doesn't allow me. So stick with it as it is, use it as it is. Uh, hopefully somewhere down the line, we will have a much longer uh, visualization or just the plotting uh, class. And I would try to uh, handle it there. But what I'm doing is that I'm telling it that I'm going to use a two by two structure. So we are gonna have two images on column, two images on the row, and then we use this thing where we are inheriting these setups. So we will have one image and one image on first axis and the other and other on the second axis and we just use it. And what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna call all of these images. So I have the endo cell, which is as it is. It was original, normal thing, turn off the axis. Tight axis will put them close together. Then I call the bright field on the second one and act in as I just generated. And now if you do all of this and you have, uh, feel free to read it on your own time and try to do it. If you do this, here is what we get. We have the original image, 
the bright field image is a very dim image because there was really nothing in no information that you could read other than these self fluorescing spots, I suppose. And now you have actin here on the green channel and the nuclei on the blue channel. Oftentimes, we also have a thing that we have to do where we have to drop the colors very simply. And you could have just then that CMAP gray. So we could have called the gray scale and you could have just used this routine.rgb to gray. And you can either do that or you can set as gray to true. And so in this case, you could have just taken this image and plot. Just to re-emphasize the fact, if you don't set your color map, you will see that this image doesn't look quite the gray. And that's because again, matplotlib tries to interpret the colors on its own with a default color scale. So please don't forget to set that. Otherwise you will wonder, well, what happened? Maybe the gray didn't work, but that's basically the gray scale images. And you can also, when you imported it at that time, you can have just given it to the, uh, uh, the iu.imread and you could have done it that way too. So this is the uh, second part. I hope we have time to cover it. So let's uh, quickly jot through that. What I'm trying to give you is another uh, a useful tool to look at into your images, uh, not only as, um, as, as an, an, a NumPy array, but to look at into something that goes behind everything that you do using Python as an image. So this is the other image that I have there. Uh, call for that, uh, look for that image called face.tiff in your data file. Uh, call for it and we just rendered it. So this is an image of these bacteria. It's a normal bright field image. So as not surprisingly, you see a lot of other things in here. When you ask Python to tell, uh, let's say that we want to isolate only bacteria from this image. The way to do this is now you have to create a cutoff. You have to tell Python what is bacteria and what is not. And that requires these steps called segmentation. And then it, by default, the segmentation also requires something called thresholding. Segmentation is the process by which we are separating the region. So we are going to separate what is bacteria and what is not bacteria. And to do that, we first have to see what this image pixel distribution is. So I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to display it by a histogram of that image. Uh, what is going on here is a very simple uh, matplotlib routine. Again, as I said, we are going to create a subplot of one and two. Uh, on one, I will show you the image and the, uh, uh, I will show you the histogram and on that I'll show you the uh, image as it looks. And here is, if you do this, you will notice this is the pixel distribution of the image. There is a background and then there is a lot of these sharp images. Sometimes it is difficult to see these in the normal numeric scale. So you can set this to logarithmic scale. And if you do that, here, you can see this, that there is a serious dip here. And basically what it is, is that given that there's a lot of this is a background, you would expect that this section here is the background and this section here is the bacteria and in between is the threshold. So first we will do the new uh, threshold by eyeballing and we will, we will come back to that and then we will, uh, I'll show you that how eyeballing is not needed, but it is important for me to tell you why you have to do first by eyeballing because sometimes there might be caveats in the image uh, that you may, if you do everything by automation, you might miss it. So I will say safely that somewhere around here at around 250 or 300 is the difference between bacteria and the background. So what we're going to do is we're going to guess that threshold. So going back to the same thing, we create these two images and what I'm going to do is that I am going to draw this line at the threshold just to tell you that this is what my threshold value is. And if you want to on the log scale, I can do this on the log scale and this is where my threshold is. So I'm just arbitrarily setting the threshold to 300. If I do that, how I'm gonna use this thresholding? I will tell that my threshold is 300. So I create a variable threshold, thresh underscore phase equal to 300. And now I would subtract my image by this cutoff. This is a logical operator that you have seen me using before. So I take the my entire image. Remember, it's nothing but a numeric data. So everything can be subtracted. So from the original phase image, I subtract my array by 300 and I generate now this M phase BW. 
And now from there, I'm going to build this RGB image, just like the D stack that I showed you before, just to show you what happened. And the green channel, I'll saturate to the max to one. Unfortunately, I mean, you can choose any number you want. And now when I plot this, you will notice that this is what is happening. You can see it's not perfect because we have still been left a lot of these green spots, which are exactly not the background. They, and the one reason why it is happening is because this image, if you notice here, is actually a pretty noisy image. The background is not quite defined very well. So one way to do it would be that you just take a better quality image. And often time as a biologist, we had the luxury to have a fluorescent image. So if a better quality image, that would be so there's another data file that is, I've given you, it's called cfp.tiff, which is the same bacteria probed with uh, CFP color. And if you look at that image, that looks much more cleaner and brighter. So if you'd be working with something like this, you will be able to filter it much better. And I'll show you how that filtering works much better, but then there are uh, pitfalls even there, which you have to be aware. And now what I'm going to do is that I can, uh, the pitfalls, while this image looks very good, one of the things that you may not notice right away is that actually sometime on your microscope, there can be a bad pixel. And you can see that this is a pretty bright pixel down here. And it's basically have been extracted out down here. So you have to be, uh, you have to have an astute eye, but even if you don't, the automation will work pretty well. Um, and, and we will just, I, I can either skip it, um, Actually, let's, let's just quickly go through that. One way to remove these noise is what we call a median filter. And why it is important for me to handle this median filter is that somewhere down the line, um, if there is ever this iteration of this class, um, we can use something like more fancier, like Gaussian filter, which will do this job even better. But these filters, actually what they do is that we create a structural element and we take that structural element and we just pass it around the image and exactly the way I did in the thresholding, that pixel, that, that structuring element will then be suppressing what is on the background. Now, of course, first thing I'm gonna do here is a manual. Uh, it's just creating a square of that structuring element, which is kind of a crude way to do it. A better approach would be, those who understand the Gaussian process better would be do it by a Gaussian. And then you give it a sigma value and then use that sigma value to then suppress that noise and then you enhance the background or enhance the useful information from the background information. But let's do a plain simple uh, structuring element. So I create this a structuring element square, three pixel long, and I do this median filter where the median value is then being used to then subtract from the background. So I just use this filter again, uh, this is one of the routines that I called in the beginning, dot filters. And when you do this, you will see that now we have a pretty good threshold down here and that image uh, as it looked before has now been cleaned out. And we, we remember that in the threshold value, so now we use this 140. And if we create a threshold image from there, you will see that now we have a pretty good filtering, most of, and this is the CFP image. This would not work so well for the bright field image because the bright field image, no matter what you do, is still gonna be terrible. But here you can see that what we have told the Python to subtract the background from bacteria is a pretty good job. It knows which is bacteria and which is Python. Now, of course, this was all manual and that's not fun ever to do. Uh, why are we doing it if you were to do it manually? So there are lots of very good thresholding routines. Uh, Otsu's was one of the first and it continues to be uh, one of the more popular one. So instead of manually eyeballing it, we can just call this Otsu from the built-in filters, and there are lots of filters. Uh, look at them, what they are. What I do is that I've been calling those filters, which I have called in a scikit before, and from there I'm choosing this Otsu uh, threshold filter and pass my image to that. And I generate this threshold image. Similarly for CFP, uh, the filtered image that I just generated, I pass that to give it to Otsu. And Otsu does a pretty good job of doing it. And as you can see here, when I run it, you see that we had eyeballed the phase image, the, the somewhat dirtier image to be 300, whereas the Otsu think it is 437. And the reason why it is telling you it's 437 is primarily because the image was so much more noisier uh, that it kind of doesn't know exactly where the background is. So the crux is, if you want to analyze, if you want to automate things, 
use an image which is a good quality. If you don't have a good quality image, automation may not be your best choice. So you want to go back and do it manually. But for the CFP image, uh, you can see that eyeballed, and I particularly use it I-40, which was not the best choice because I could have seen that the dip is somewhere here, but I mean, give and take. Here, it worked very well. What we chose it to be 140 and what the Otsu thought is nearly similar. So we will use this and now I will just quickly go around and plot this for you to look at into what has happened. So these are the two values and this was the, the phase image with kind of a dirtier background and the CFP is, sorry, it's the other way around. The, the CFP is the clean, tighter image with very little dispersion in the background and everything else. Whereas for the, uh, for the bright field image, you can see that the pixel were going all over the place, but uh, these are our cutoffs. I'll conclude this by showing what this thresholding and filtering is useful for. And one of the simple thing from that image, we can extract the bacterial area. And all we are doing is we are adding up all the pixels that we have called the background from bacteria. So we know what the bacteria are. They are just the numeric arrays. We can just sum them together and from there, we can calculate what the total area is. And if you are working on a microscope where you know what the interpixel distance is, so you know, and this is into your uh, instrument manual, if you know what the interpixel distance is, all you do is that then you multiply that by the interpixel distance, and from there, uh, you can generate the overall area. And so here it is. In that image, the bacteria overall were 150.6 square microns. Um, you can use such a routine to actually generate a growth curve on bacteria um, where you just give it a stack of images taken in an automated setup in a microscope every X amount of snap. And then once you have generated it, you can write a script and will basically go through it, take the entire library of those images, run them onto itself and will chug along and give you a beautiful uh, growth curve, which unfortunately we don't have time today to cover it. Um, somewhere down the line probably it will be fun to show you how these things can become uh, handy. So at this point, I'll stop. Uh, we have a couple of minutes uh, before I uh, have to dart out. Uh, if there's a quick question, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, send me an email. Hi, Sanjay. Um, Hi, Salma. Uh, um, so I uh, thank you. This was a really useful session. Thank you so much. Um, actually, I was interested in the um, fluorescent image of the hex cell. Mm -hmm. Quantify and I and I wrote this qu uh, question in the messages earlier. Oh, I didn't see that. Let's see uh, what's on the chat. Yeah. Could you quantify the in in intensity? Could I utilize the bacterial area uh, code mm -hmm. to quantify the intensity for fluorescent images for certain structures, subcellular structures? Um, yes, you can. If you, so long as you know that they are normalized to something, uh, if you know what your normal is, because when you're saying quantify, what you mean is that you need to know what the zero scale for you as in one scale is. Um, if, if you want, you can normalize entire scale. So remember, we have this histogram plot, right? So if you take this image, and basically this is the kind of thing you'll be doing. Uh, once you have the histogram, you know what the distribution is. And whatever distribution comes from each image, you can background it to your, you can just subtract it by your background or divided by the background. So now everything is a scale from zero to one. And then each image has an internal normalization and from there you can do that. If okay. you're doing a period of images, then I would suggest to have a background image, which then you use and it is at that point, it becomes a simple uh, data uh, processing because you know what the histogram here is, you know what the value across is, and then you subtract every subsequent image. And from there, you know what the area of interest is. Okay, that's, that's useful. Thank you so yeah. much. You're welcome. Any other question? I just had a quick question. So when you yes. were importing the images, does the import routine automatic light, automatically like decompress the JPEG and basically turn everything into like an RBG or? Uh, the default there is the JPEG. If you would be so, that will work for JPEG, PNG and TIFF. If you have an image which is neither of those, uh, I understand that there are, uh, sometimes there are proprietary images uh, like the, uh, uh, the AI images and all, they would not directly be imported. RGB is the default. Um, I have never tried a CMYK image. I don't know what happens, but I'm sure uh, there is a way to convert a CMYK to RGB if that's what your question is. Yeah, um, I just, was wondering whether the conversion of the file types was automatic and it sounds like it is. 
Well, yeah, I mean, see, the, yeah. the, CN, the PNG, JPEG, and TIFF, they follow the same color mapping. So there it should not be a problem. If you're using a file which has a different uh, color mapping, then probably you should be paying attention to that. The, in the very, uh, in the one where you read in the first JPEG image, there was something you had set like the limits to be 10 by 10 or something. I forget what that was. Yeah, right there. This uh, I'm creating, I'm generating. Yeah, no, the what, go for a further, yeah, uh, uh, right, no, yeah, there. Where you I just said, set the fix size. It doesn't have to be. If you would not do that, it will still, I just uh, wanted it to what bound What does it. that 10 signify? Uh, 10 is just the, the it's the scale on the matplot system. Uh, okay, uh, it is okay. not, yeah, it's, it's it, it, unfortunately, uh, Matplot has its own um, odd understanding of what the, the, what the indices are. They're not exactly mapped to the pixel. So if you have a big image, it will still be shrunk to that. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I got to, I got to run. Um, yeah. uh, please send me an email if there is any more question. Um, I, I, I would be, uh, I would be glad to answer if something is uh, to be answered there.